Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and as usual I have several pages of questions here, uh, all of them provided by you guys, the awesome patrons who make it possible for me to do Forgotten Weapons here every day. Uh, we'll just jump right into it. Uh, let's see, Eric, with a somewhat Polish sounding last name, says, I just got my CNR license. I would love my first purchase to be a Polish gun. Uh, what would you recommend for someone starting to collect for the first time? If you can't recommend a Polish gun, then what would you recommend? Well, there are a number of Polish uh, options out there that are, are pretty cool and interesting. Uh, which one you go with really depends on kind of what your interests are and what your budget is. So uh, one of the ones that came to mind is the Tantal, which is really the Polish take on the AKM uh, in 545, and it's a really cool gun, but it's not a CNR eligible gun at this point. So kind of leave that one off the table. Um, as for CNR, the three that come to my mind would be if you're on a significant budget, uh, there are a couple of Polish uh, compact or subcompact uh, pistols out there. Uh, the P83 Vanad or Vanad uh, is the one that really comes to mind, and those are only what, two to three hundred bucks probably. Now they're interesting in a historical sense because they came out of Poland, Cold War, they're the sort of guns that until fairly recently were completely unaccessible and generally not very well known, and now because a whole big batch of them showed up, now they're on the surplus market for just a couple hundred bucks and everyone looks at them and kind of as well, they're kind of junky because they're cheap, and we often combine cheap must mean poor quality. We're going to touch on that in some later questions too. So that's an option out there. To me they're not the most interesting guns, but if you're interested more in pistols than rifles then that's something to definitely consider. If you have a bit of a larger budget and you're interested in pistols, definitely the thing I would suggest looking at is the, the VIZ, uh, what we call in this country the Radom, uh, WZ35 VIZ. Uh, and that is a 9mm, kind of a Polish take on the 1911 sort of, with some differences with a decocking lever. Um, they were manufactured in Poland before World War II, and then uh, the German occupation government continued their production, and there are a couple different varieties of them. At the really high end you've got pre-war Polish marked ones, which in their, uh, when they originally came out of the factory are just absolutely beautiful guns, extremely well made, great finish, cool Polish crest on them. Uh, and then as, as that transitions to German manufacture and then turns into kind of last ditch manufacture by the end of the war, the guns become mechanically simpler, the finish gets really crude, uh, and that's I think for someone who's interested specifically in Polish guns that's a really excellent area to take a look at. Uh, there is a book out there specifically on the VIS Radom. Radom is the name of the factory, but everyone in the US tends to call the pistol the Radom, so be aware of that going in. Anyway, there is a book out there on them, I haven't reviewed it, but I do have a copy, uh, and if you decide to get into that field, that book would be a really good resource to have. Uh, my third option for you would be Mausers. There are a number of Polish, basically Polish made Mauser 98s out there, um, that are also kind of the same thing. They were made before the war, they were also used by the Germans, so you've got a couple of different options to look at. However mechanically they are Mauser 98s, and there's not a whole lot to separate them besides a few markings and you know a few very specific features, the sling configurations, the barrel lengths, the sight configurations, that sort of thing. So uh, to my mind the most interesting readily accessible Polish CNR firearm would probably be the Viz pistol. Will says, your recent Hotchkiss revolving cannon reminded me of when you did a video on a reproduction that used 50 BMG brass but black powder hand loads. You said it was because the action wasn't up to smokeless full 50 BMG. Is this true, uh, or is this due to the manufacturing of the reproduction, or is the design inherently not up to it? This is a question I've been asked a couple times, especially when that video came out years ago, and what I have learned since is that the reason that it was specifically marked for black powder only was actually one of liability, that the manufacturer didn't want to take on any liability from people overloading 50 BMG, and, and you know if you do that, if you overpressure and blow up a 50 BMG you're causing a really potentially destructive situation, and so what they did was they specified black powder only, because there's no way you could cram enough black powder into a 50 BMG case to cause any harm to that gun. Um, whether the action is actually up to it or not, with full power regular 
factory 50 BMG? I have no idea. And to be honest, I don't want to really make a statement about it one way or another for the exact same reason. Uh, I don't want to be the guy who says, yeah, it was, it was just a marketing, you know, a liability thing. So go ahead and have fun. And then the next person who does it blows the gun up. Um, I have no idea. If you have a 50 BMG Hotchkiss revolving cannon reproduction, I would do some more research and try and talk to the original manufacturers and find out what the real deal is. Uh, Will also has a bonus question, Tarha or Fleur? Uh, and the answer is, I like them both. I had to pick one, go with Fleur. In fact, I've only ever bought one like band shirt and it was that one. That's one of my favorite albums of all time. Uh, Brandon says, any good recommendations on finding primary sources for research? If you want primary sources, you're going to have to look to archives. Uh, or maybe not have to, but you're definitely, your, your best bet will be looking to archives. So in the United States, the US National Archives have an incredible amount of stuff. Now one of the problems, and I should say most other National Archives do as well, although I'm not nearly as familiar with accessing them, uh, one problem with primary source research in the archives is you can't do it online uh, and you can't really do it very quickly. You have to go there and become acquainted with what's in all the boxes and it will inevitably involve digging through a lot of random material that you're not interested in and miscellaneous memos uh, that you have to, you will often probably have to read in some depth and you know put together you know, trace communications. You can't just, you won't necessarily look at one document and be like, oh, this explains the answer to my question. Often it's going to be this guy talked to that guy and then back to this guy and then over to this other guy. And once you figure out what the whole conversation was over this series of, of communications or letters, then you'll find the answer to some question. Or you may find that there, uh, you know, there were issues that were resolved that you don't find out about in any other sort of secondhand uh, referencing. But it is the best way to find the most in-depth information, but it's also the most time consuming and the most difficult. So uh, Brandon, I suspect, may be looking for Portuguese primary sources, and I have no idea where to point you there except for find the, uh, the factory in Portugal, find out if it's still around, maybe they have archives still, if not, maybe the government does, maybe the military does. You may have trouble getting into a military archive in a country that you are not a citizen of. Um, maybe, maybe not, but that's where I'd start. Rob says, uh, do you think media like films and games are having a positive effect on the gun world, i.e. bringing things into the open, or negative, i.e. stereotyping things? It's always both, I think. Um, in, in media, you're always going to have misconceptions and, and mis- things are going to be presented in ways that aren't realistic and are sometimes counterproductive uh, to, you know, education and, and understanding the truth about things. But that sort of, it, when, when you put a, a subject in, the con in an entertainment context, you're going to interest people in that subject. You're going to find people who go, whoa, I just watched John Wick and guns are cool and I want to learn more about them. And all of the nonsense stuff, that is in John Wick, which actually has a little bit less of it than most, but it's still, you know, just, it, it is an action movie out there. Uh, if someone sees that, decides to get into guns, they will then learn the things that are in fact not factually accurate from Hollywood or from games. And, and I think overall it is probably better to get people interested by showing them things that maybe aren't entirely accurate. Um, and trust that as that, that their interest will lead them to learn more and deeper and understand things better. Uh, John asks, what's the story with the Amazon Prime Forgotten Weapons content? I never really had a, I, maybe I should have announced this more formally, but uh, basically Gold Harbor Media is a guy um, who I got in touch with. He started talking, he does a lot of uh, of other content on Amazon Prime, especially like really, really schlocky sci-fi horror exploitation sort of movies. Uh, but has, he, he had a ton of experience in packaging material for Amazon and going through Amazon's process for getting material approved for Amazon Prime. And he thought compilations of Forgotten Weapons material would be a perfect fit for it. And I think it also is. 
And so we have a collaborative thing going where he packages things together in by subject and puts them up on Amazon, and uh, they are up there for you guys to watch. Uh, some of I think there are a couple I think that are pay to watch, but virtually all of them are free for Amazon Prime. Christopher says, uh, "What future books are in the works from Headstamp Publishing?" I think I remember talks of a British sniper rifle book next, but I'm really curious as to what might follow. Uh, we have two books specifically in the works right now to follow up on mine, Chasse de Famas. Uh, the first one of those is a book not on British sniper rifles, but on British bullpup rifles, and that will cover everything from the Thornycroft, uh, circa 1900, uh, all the way through the, the current SA-80 series. So there were a bunch of experimental and quasi small production bullpups uh, in the, the mid, you know, just after World War II, the EM-1, the EM-2, those sorts of guns, and then development of the L85 and L86. That's going to be an awesome book um, that's actually being written by Jonathan Ferguson, who is curator of the National Firearms Center. So he's got all those guns right at his disposal to work with, and access to the British uh, archives to do research in, and that's going to be an awesome book. Uh, after that, we also have a book coming up on a, a very niche subject, but one that I think is going to be really interesting, and that is the history of the Kabul arsenal in Kabul, Afghanistan. I think a lot of people expect that all the guns that came out of Afghanistan were just, you know, hand built in little huts. In reality, there was a modern, very real manufacturing arsenal in Kabul um, around the turn of the century, and they put out guns that are well built, true, you know, factory manufactured firearms, largely Martini Henrys and variants thereof, but we have a, a book on that subject that is also in the works um, and absolutely coming. A bunch of the writings done on that, a bunch of the photography's done, um, it's, it's in the process. So after that we have a couple more things that we're working on lining up with authors, some you've heard of, some you haven't. I don't want to talk about those until I know that they're done deals, but we've, we've got a, a substantial pipeline of cool material in the works. Let's see, Alexander says, an interesting trend, uh, an interesting modern trend is carbine conversion kits for pistols. Are there any interesting historical versions of this? How old is the concept really? So I think he's talking about primarily things like the Roni, where you have a, a carbine chassis and you can drop a Glock frame into it and presto your pistol has become a, a carbine. Uh, those actually present some interesting subtle legal issues in the US with the short barreled rifle considerations and the, the legal technicalities of converting a pistol to a rifle and a rifle to a pistol. I don't want to get into those today because that's a really nitpicky sort of subject. There, We have a, a pretty long history, basically as long as there have been handguns there have been stocks to put on handguns. The thing that doesn't often happen is, is, add, is like extending the barrel length. Um, sometimes this could be done, for example there are some of the star pistols from the uh, the mid 20th century, where they would have a you know an extended magazine and a buttstock you could snap onto the back of the grip, and then also something like a 16 inch barrel that you could swap out um, and and put into the the gun. There were let's see the uh, French Unique company made the Model L in I believe the 60s, and that is exactly this sort of thing. It is a carbine upper. Um, this was a 22 rimfire and it was a little little compact subcompact 22 caliber pistol, and then a, basically a 22 caliber plinking rifle upper. And just like the Roni, you would pull the slide off of the pistol and then you could fit the grip frame up into uh, a rifle chassis where it made it up with its own bolt <coughs> and barrel and the whole upper assembly of the gun. So those were around, they were never all that popular. They're still out there, people are interested in them. Um, let's see what else. Uh, the Dardic. <laughs> Not exactly a particularly successful gun, but it also had a system like that where you could drop a Dardic revolver frame into a carbine barrel conversion upper. I think the Gyrojet did, I'm not 100% on that. The biggest problem you typically run into is you can't really extend a barrel. So if you're going to do a carbine conversion like that, you have to have two complete barrels. Uh, the Gyrojet actually is a little bit of an exception to this possibly, because it was smoothbore and not rifled and wasn't building up pressure or anything. So building an extended, like having a barrel extension on a gyrojet would be easier than any of these others. 
I think the fundamental problem with them is you don't, if you're going to, when you design the gun, you're either going to design it to be a good pistol or a good carbine. And the two aren't completely interchangeable. Uh, you will get things like, well, you know, the, the grip and the trigger are not nearly as good, or, or they aren't the right form in a carbine if they're designed as a pistol. And typically I think people are more interested in buying the one gun that they are particularly looking to have than in buying one that can be so-so at two different roles. It always sounds good on paper, but when the money actually comes down to it, I think people tend to look at it and go, you know what, for just, in, instead of paying, you know, let's say $100 for the pistol and then $50 for the conversion kit, if I spend 100 for the pistol, I can spend another 100 and get a standalone rifle and I can have them both at the same time and they're both best at being the pistol or the rifle and I'm willing to spend that much extra money rather than having, you know, rather than spending $150 on this middle ground thing where it can only be one at a time and and whatever the secondary thing is, it's not not quite right. Nick says, if you were in the trenches of World War One, what would your loadout be and why? Um, my first choice would be an MP18. If I were gonna, if I had to be in World War One, uh, that's what I would want because I think that is um, at long longer range, your shooting is more opportunistic and not in you know immediate self defense. Uh, when when you are in immediate need in World War One of shooting someone instead of say taking cover um, and trying to move either forward or back without getting shot, when you immediately need to shoot someone, it's going to be in close proximity, and I would far I would be far more happy with a submachine gun than a bolt action rifle or a handgun. And the one submachine gun that was really in use during World War One was the MP18. Uh, and even if we consider the Italian ones, which were it, presumably, I think they were in some use, I'd rather have the MP18. I think it was probably the better of the two guns. If I couldn't have that, my second choice I think would be an RSC 1917, because that is the only semi-automatic rifle uh, that was actually in service. If you want to talk about weird experimental things, that's a different story, but for guns that were actually issued, a semi-automatic rifle is a fundamental advantage over a bolt-action rifle, and that would be my, my backup choice behind a submachine gun. Steven says, could you talk a little bit about the cartridges used on black powder guns like the Gras and the Kropacek? Uh, were they similar to what we use today, or, or what would have been used in previous wars like the Civil War? That's an easy one. Um, those black powder cartridges, in this case with those two guns, the 11 millimeter Gras cartridge, but um, this is exactly in the same time period, same same type of cartridge as the 4570, as the 11 millimeter Mauser. Um, there were a whole bunch of these cartridges, uh, 11 millimeter Monlicker, and they are fundamentally exactly like cartridges we have today, except the powder inside was black powder instead of smokeless powder. Uh, they're typically rimmed cartridges, which is less common today, but not fundamentally any different. Uh, it's a brass cartridge case. It's a bullet in the front, powder in the middle, center fire primer in the base. Um, the bullets typically around that time period are not going to be jacketed, they're going to be just solid lead, and they would often have a, um, a, a paper wrap around the base of the bullet, um, but really that, that paper is the only difference between one of those cartridges and a totally modern cartridge. We got that instead of a, a copper jacket on the bullet. So. Uh, yeah, very easy. They're they're very much like modern cartridges. Uh, in fact, to the point that you can still use them. In some of like forty five seventy is still used as a modern cartridge, as long as the firearm that you're using it in is capable of withstanding smokeless powder. You can load forty five seventy with smokeless powder, and a modern jacketed bullet, and it works just as well as it did as a black powder round. All right. Following up on that, uh, Ryan says. I really don't honestly understand what advantage the Kropacek offered over the Gras to justify its adoption so soon after the Franco-Prussian War. The war was lost because Bismarck beat the pants off Louis Napoleon diplomatically and strategic gaffes made by the French high command. So why focus on the one factor that performed rather well instead of things like modernizing the artillery corps? Brass cases are the better technology, but paired with black powder it seems like an incremental improvement rather than a game changer. So. Um, First off, I think you'd fit in really well with the French high command, because that was their decision at the time. The French army did not adopt the Kropacek. It was only adopted 
uh, by the French Navy in relatively small numbers. Uh, that was in 1878. The French army didn't actually start adopting something like that uh, until 1884, and even then it was relatively slow. The benefit I would I would say to a repeating rifle over a single shot rifle is kind of analogous to a, a, a rifle that is typically going to be used in semi-auto but has a full auto selector switch. So we know that you're, you know, a full auto, a select fire rifle is generally used in semi with auto reserve for specific exceptional situations. And what the Kropacek allowed was the same sort of thing, where yes, as long as you're firing in volleys under command of an officer uh, in a well-controlled situation, it's not a big deal to single load cartridges. Um, however, if things get really hairy, the ability to have that magazine there is kind of like being able to flip to auto when you need it for an emergency. So you can engage the magazine and make seven or eight shots in rapid succession before you have to reload. And that could be the thing that gives a unit, especially a small unit that's being outnumbered, which by the way, the Navy with shore parties and marine type detachments, that's a situation they're going to be in potentially a lot more often than the Army. Um, that magazine gives them potentially the opportunity to have a, you know, a, a one-off burst of much greater firepower. And I think there's absolutely value in having that. It is also, however, important to recognize that if you're going to fire a hundred rounds, a single shot rifle is probably going to do it just in the, it's not going to do it any slower than say a tube fed Kropacek because with a tube fed gun, you're going to fire your eight rounds much faster than the single shot gun, or at least faster than the single shot gun. But then you've got to reload eight rounds. And the way it typically kind of tends to play out is that it's the same amount of time to take a cartridge from your belt and put it into the gun, no matter what the system is, whether it, as long as you're single, as long as you're doing it one round at a time. Stripper clips can make a, a fundamental change in this equation, but if you have a tube magazine, the difference between having a single shot gra and pull a cartridge out, put it in the thing, close it, fire it, eject it, grab your next cartridge. The difference between that, doing that say eight times, and doing first eight repetitions of take a cartridge out and load it into the gun, and then eight repetitions of fire, work the bolt, fire, work the bolt, those things come out at basically the same overall complete time. So what you're saying is valid. In some, in a lot of situations, there is not an advantage to the to a tube-fed repeating rifle. However, there are those situations where you want to be able to delay that reloading time, even though it, you're, you're making more reloading time, but you're delaying it. Well, those seven or eight rounds may be exactly what you need to get out of a bad situation. Next up is Keith, who says, I just saw your video about the Swiss Luger uh, when I saw an online gun auction for an Interarms imported Luger. This Luger immediately jumped out at me because it shares the straight front grip strap of the Swiss Luger. So my question is, what, if any, is the link between the two? There is a very distinct link between the two. So the Interarms imported Luger that you saw was manufactured by the Mauser company after World War II. Uh, and it was done specifically on a contract for Interarms. Basically, Interarms in the United States looked at the market and said, wow, there's a lot of people who want Lugers, and I bet we could make money if we could buy a batch of brand new Lugers from some manufacturer and sell them here in the United States. So they went and approached Mauser, seems like an appropriate company to talk to, and Mauser thought this was a good idea. Mauser needed some work. This would have been a nice lucrative contract for them. But Mauser didn't have any of the tooling to build Lugers. Uh, it had all been destroyed. So what they ended up doing was they got in, they went over to Switzerland, talked to Bern, the Waffenfabrik Bern. Bern still had all of its tooling for Lugers and was willing to sell it to Mauser. So Mauser bought Swiss Luger tooling to make the, the Lugers for Interarms. And they just left them in the original Swiss configuration, which is why they have that Swiss simplified straight front grip strap. Now it's interesting to point out this was a really difficult thing and it cost, I, I think ultimately it cost Mauser a substantial amount of money to do this. It was not profitable for them um, for a bunch of reasons. Like it turned out all of the Swiss tooling was pretty much worn out. You know, they'd been using it for a couple decades. The things like the measurement gauges all had to be rebuilt and that was a huge expense that Mauser hadn't been anticipating. And then there were also like, How's this for an unexpected and, you know, like not catastrophic, but huge substantial problem? 
um, it was, I think it was the, I, I'm probably going to get this backwards, but the, the Swiss plans were designed around machine tools that held, I believe it was the, the Swiss tools held uh, the tool head in one place. So think like you're holding a, a, a drill and then you take the part and you move the part around to make all the cuts. Where the Mauser tooling was all based on holding the part in one place and moving the tool head around to make cuts. So all of the technical drawings were basically unusable for Mauser's machine tools and they had to completely redo all of the technical drawings. So there's a whole story to that. Um, in fact there's a book out there called The Parabellum is Back um, that describes basically everything about every, every development of the Luger post-1945 and covers that situation in, in some depth. So if you're interested in it that's an interesting book to, uh, to check out. Gas Air Spark. Uh, actually we have a number of questions here now about my book. Of course I didn't mention it at the beginning but we are still, we are in fact now uh, coming right up on the end of the Kickstarter pre-launch for my book, Chasseau de Famas, uh, French Military Rifles 1866 to 2016. It is hopefully going to be the best collector's guide to these guns out there. Uh, I'm really excited about it. The Kickstarter has absolutely blown the doors off. Uh, way beyond my expectations. However, um, you still have an opportunity to get in on it now and just because it's done fantastically well doesn't mean there's any reason not to still participate. Um, as it is right now if you're in on the Kickstarter you get $10 discount on the book compared to the retail version, uh, $20 discount actually on a signature edition if that's what you're looking for. And uh, we have a whole whole slew of features that we were able to add to the book as a result of blowing away stretch goals. Most of those will be in the retail book but not quite all of them. So I'll have a link in the description to that Kickstarter. And uh, now let's talk about a couple questions related to it. Gas Air Spark says, what do I have planned now that the book is pretty much finished? Well, <laughs> it's not quite finished. There's a, a fair amount of work still to do. So we are currently in the editing and layout stage, which means there is a lot of, of um, like really nitpicky checking and tweaking and um, arranging the layout on what is going to be probably a four to five hundred page book is not trivial. You know, making sure that all the pictures are just right and focus on on the elements that I want each picture to show. Make sure all the picture captions are good and everything flows nicely. Uh, and then we've got the actual printing process. Um, we're going to be delivering books. Uh, the expectation is, I believe, November. If we can get it done earlier, we absolutely will. But that's what we're planning on right now. Um, and there's going to be a lot that goes into that. So among those things like at this point something like 3,000 signed copies of the book, which is that's that's a really huge endeavor. I'm going to be hand signing thousands of books. Um, I am in fact probably going to be flying to the publishing uh, factory uh, and, and doing that by hand there. Like they're going to print the, the page sections that will be uh, like the title pages. Uh, and I will sign those and then they'll be bound into the books rather than try and deal with you know pallets, literal pallets upon pallets of books. You know, open up all the boxes, open the book, sign the book, close the book. Um, we're going to simplify that a bit by signing pages before they get bound but there's still a lot going into it. So that's my first half is like it's yes it's almost done but there's still a lot of work ahead on it. Um, what do I have planned next? I definitely this as, as painful as the process is at the end um, it is painful for an author to go through the editing process and have professional people tell you how all your work sucks and needs to be fixed. Um, but despite all of that um, and my poor wrist signing thousands of books I'm excited to do another one. Um, I have a couple of subjects in mind but again I don't really want to go into detail on those until I'm, I'm sure about exactly what I'm going to be working on because there's always the chance that that I could get started and decide that this just isn't a project that's going to work well and I don't want to get people's hopes or expectations up before that. Um, I will be taking a little bit of a break from book writing uh, in between the two though just to let myself recuperate a little bit. Uh, Thomas says, I know this is too soon but after your book Chasseau de Famas will you consider writing the book Le Fachot to Mab P15? Uh, no, probably not that one. It is something that I did think about when I was doing this book. However, part of the reason that I picked the subject that I did is that there was basically nothing out there on the topic written in English and I wanted to cover it. There are a couple of good books out there on French handguns. I think 
they, you know, the books could be made a little better. Um, I think there's a little more information that could go into them. They could be all color with really nice photography, like we're going to be doing for everything in Head Stamp, but fundamentally the information is already out there, and I would like to focus on things where there isn't a good resource yet. Jason says, with all those signed versions being sold on Kickstarter, is your wrist ready for all that writing? No. No it is not. Um, I'm kind of dreading that. Uh, a Honey says, do you think your recent success with your uh, book launch on Kickstarter is an indication of the direction of book publishing is headed, i.e. high-end, small-batch, boutique books for a targeted market, or is print ultimately doomed? I think print is, is definitely not doomed. Um, if I did think print was doomed, I would not have gotten into partnering up to form a publishing company. However, I think some of print is doomed. I think the, the kind of read it once and dispose of it print is toast. Um, I think magazines are not long for this world, and newspapers have even less time for them. I think that stuff is readily and easily replaced by online media, and online media offers a lot of advantages over those formats. However, when it comes to reference material, when it comes to books that you're going to take down off the shelf and use repeatedly, over and over and over, not as opposed to books that you're going to read once, uh, paperback novels, maybe some problems there. I don't know that I'd really be wanting to get into paperback novel publishing these days. Um, but good quality reference books, I think, have a long and strong future in front of them. Uh, Bobby says, of all the open bolt SMGs, what are the top three fun and interesting? Uh, I will restrict this to the ones that I've actually shot, um, because I kind of have to. Um, and of those, and we restrict it to open bolt, my top three favorite most interesting ones would be the Owen, the Beretta 38A specifically, as opposed to the later iterations of the Beretta, um, and the ZK383. Uh, those three were all extremely pleasant guns to shoot, very controllable, uh, and they, they all have some interesting features to them. So the bolt designs in all of them are a little bit more complex than just the simple like you'd have in a Sten or most other open bolt guns. So the ZK383 uh, has a removable weight, lets you change the rate of fire. The Owen of course has this weird kind of firewall in the middle of it, uh, in the middle of the receiver. And, uh, and then the Beretta has a, a neat sort of, it, it's basically a hammer built into an open bolt gun um, that I think is part of the reason why the Beretta 38A in particular is such a nice, sweet, controllable gun to shoot. So all three of those were really cool. When I was thinking about this question, however, I realized that ultimately my favorite submachine gun type firearms are in fact the closed bolt ones. Um, in particular, the MP5 and the VZ61 uh, Scorpion. I really would love to have examples of those. Um, they're a lot of fun to shoot. They're some of my very favorites to shoot on the rare occasions that I get to, and I think part of the reason for that is that they are closed bolt, and thus they are capable of much better accuracy in, in semi-auto fire, um, and, and it also lets them be lighter. Like, you can get away from that open bolt thing of having this big heavy bolt that's just ka-chunka, 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 back and forth. Let's see. Max says, when did you start considering yourself an expert on your material? Did or do you ever experience imposter syndrome? Um, I really try to avoid ever considering myself an expert on something. I've gotten to the point where I have a lot, like maybe too much knowledge on French rifles, but the danger is if you ever take that label of expert and, and like adopt it and use it yourself, you're immediately shooting yourself in the foot. Because I don't care how much you know, you never know everything. And if you start assuming that you know everything, um, you're going to miss stuff. Um, there's, there's always something new out there. You, I learn something new every single day, even on French rifles, a subject that I've been studying in a lot of depth for many years now. Um, so I, I don't ever want to be called an expert. I don't like the term. Um, imposter syndrome uh, for those of you who haven't heard the term before, it's it's a phenomenon of people who are very successful in a field who have like this debilitating paranoia, or maybe not that severe all the time, but this they're always doubt self doubt 
and thinking, well, I can't possibly be as good at this as everyone thinks I am. Uh, clearly they just haven't caught on to the fact that I don't know it. And I think one of the best things you can do to prevent that is to be very upfront with the fact that you don't know everything. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm always learning something new. And so to me, I'd, I'd rather assume that I don't know it all. And then I don't really have to worry about like, are, are people, you know, am I just an imposter sneaking around somehow fooling you all that I know a lot? Well, no, because I don't know nearly everything. Um, this is particularly uh, hammered home when I get questions on Facebook about like, what is this gun? Because 80% of them, I don't know. Sorry about the dog. She's angry at something. Um, and that, that really kind of keeps it real. Like I have my area of specialty and I can answer some questions about that but it's a limited area of specialty and it's, it's pretty focused. Uh, LM says, what was your favorite thing about the book that you learned when writing it? My favorite things are often just little small details, little factoids that explain substantial things. Like um, one of them would be what's like, I, I learned what the truth is behind this common expectation or common understanding that the FAMAS can only shoot steel cased ammo. That's not true actually at all. It's perfectly happy with brass cased ammo and I've ended up shooting almost exclusively brass cased ammo in mine. Where did that come from? Learning that was one of the really interesting things in the book. And, and every time I find a little detail, um, probably one of the most recent ones was if you open up a MOS 44 or 49 or 4956 and look at the hammer, on like the, the when the hammer's cocked, uh, the top surface of it as you look down into the receiver has this little semicircular cutout. And I never really thought about it until I saw someone point out that uh, when you reassemble the gun, or I'm sorry, when the, the hammer's dropped, not cocked, when it's dropped, you have this cutout on top. When you reassemble the gun, you put the bolt and bolt carrier in, and then you put your thumb on the hammer and, and dry fire the gun and close the hammer and then when you go to put the recoil spring back in the gun, it's one of these springs that has a guide rod and it fits into a cavity in the bolt, but you've got a, you know, like a third of the spring is, has to be compressed as you put the top cover back on. And it's, it's kind of often liable to kink up or bounce out or, you know, it's a little unruly, a little tricky to get in. Well, if you drop the hammer, that semicircular cutout acts as a little rest that you can push the spring down onto as you compress it and reassemble the gun much more easily. So that's one of those things. It's just this little tiny detail, but it explains why is there this feature on this part? Because every single time there's a machining cut on any manufactured part, there's a reason for it. If there, if there wasn't, that cut wouldn't be there. And so sometimes finding the explanation for some of these really kind of weird and obscure and seemingly pointless features to me, that's some of the most interesting stuff out there. Uh, Mattia says, has anyone tried to change or adapt the AK to use a short stroke gas piston or even a DI system? Not to my knowledge. Uh, I think that would require a fairly fundamental redesign of the gun because the AK doesn't have this easily distinctive upper lower separation thing that the AR does you're going to be building a brand new gun for it. If you want a short stroke gas piston AK, get a Dragonov perhaps. Um, and direct impingement, no, I've never seen anyone try to do that. Uh, I think they, they found themselves a really good system in that gun with a long stroke gas piston and stuck to it. Timothy has a repeat question. Would it have been better for Germany to adopt the Gewehr 98 in Paul Mauser's own uh, battle-proven 7x57 cartridge rather than the existing 8x57 of the Gewehr 88, especially considering the eventual changes that were made to 8x57 anyway in bore diameter and bullet design, which necessitated that they had to go rebuild all the rifles anyway. Um, also, how would standardizing on 7mm Mauser have affected German machine gun performance during World War I? Yeah, I think everything would have been better if they had adopted the Mauser 98, uh, the Gewehr 98, in 7 Mauser instead of 8. I think the machine guns would have been fine. In theory, little less long range performance. In practice, I don't think it would have mattered. Um, it's not a tremendous, like it's not a fundamental improvement, 
but it is definitely a quantitative improvement. The rifles would have had a bit less recoil, ammo would have weighed a little bit less, um, not so much that it would matter for a soldier in his basic load, but you know, when you're the guys carrying 10,000 rounds of belted ammo for the machine guns, a little bit on each cartridge adds up pretty quickly. So yeah, I think there would have been, a, there would have been no downsides and several um, quantifiable, if not life-changing upsides to seven instead of eight Mauser. Andy says, um, has any of your handling of older weapons given you ideas about how would you would design your own besides the What Would Stoner Do project? Watching the channel has inspired me to come up with several designs, one of which I'm actually in the process of patenting. Well, congratulations, good luck with it. Um, I have to say though, <laughs> what the more old, the more variety of designs I handle, the more I realize that the ones that we have standardized today are the standards for really good reasons. And the more I handle, the less interested I get in trying to design my own. Because every time you see a new design, you're like, oh, well, that possible change wouldn't have gone any better than what we have today. I think what we have is an evolutionary process that has has, has focused firearms development today on guns that are really good. Uh, and the guns that aren't around, the forgotten weapons, so to speak, are almost always forgotten for a pretty darn good reason. Keith says, convince me I shouldn't buy a Mac M11 variant machine gun. Uh, what are the downsides to machine gun ownership? To clarify, lesser known downsides besides just cost. Well, uh, the transfer time is kind of annoying. Um, there aren't a whole lot of like subtle downsides that you won't recognize. I guess make sure if you're going to buy a machine gun, make sure that the range that you plan to use it at allows full auto. There are a lot of ranges out there that don't. If you have your own private land, not a problem, but that's something to consider. Ultimately, if, if you want me to convince you not to buy a machine gun, I think it's a pretty easy argument to make. The argument is, uh, first off, you're going to pay a massive uh, increase in price compared to any sort of equivalent semi-auto gun because of the National Firearms Act and what that has done to the supply and demand equation in the United States. So first off, you're going to dump a ton of money before you put the first round through it. And is that worth it? The second thing is, even in a military sense, most machine guns are not used as machine guns. Um, if it's a, a mounted gun, yeah. Once you get something that's belt fed, yes, that's primarily used in bursts. But when it comes to rifles or submachine guns, semi-auto is virtually always the best way to use it. And in even in military training, usually it is taught as you always fire in semi-auto. And full auto is for very exceptional circumstances. So I think there's a very high likelihood that if you go through the money and go through the process and spend the money and buy a machine gun, you're going to discover that, you know what, actually, yes, it's fun to dump a magazine now and then, but if you really want the gun to be effective, um, it's semi-auto. Like, if you try and use any of these things in competition, you're going to realize I'm just as well off with a semi-auto version of the same thing. You know, the extra $25,000 that I spent to have an M16 instead of an AR-15 gives me no competitive advantage. Um, what you're doing is spending a tremendous amount of money basically for a recreational benefit. Uh, and some of these things, maybe you're going to discover that you're not even going to use that recreational benefit very often anyway. Um, you know, how many mags do you want to load? How many, how many of those single stack Mac mags do you want to load uh, when you know that it takes you about two seconds to empty them uh, and your thumb's going to get real sore from loading those things? So you want me to convince you not to buy them? That's how I would do it. I would say uh, find someone else who has one and borrow it or go to a rental range and rent one every now and then and you can spend, you could spend a lot of time with a rental machine gun and end up paying less than owning one yourself and never have to go through the NFA process and not have your money sitting in a machine gun that you may discover you don't use very much. Thomas says, have you ever come across the Galilean sights used on World War I rifles? I just finished reading Snipers in the Great War by Martin Pegler. He recommends it, as do I. Uh, and apparently there are hardly any photos of them, despite thousands being used. Um, I have seen them. Yes, I have actually encountered a 
couple very actually i think i've encountered them on one rifle once and i'm i'm still very interested i would love to try actually shooting one but from look from the time that i was able to look at one like wow it's gonna suck uh it's really a poor alternative to a proper optic and it's not really like you might be better off with iron sights maybe um so for those of you who aren't familiar, the idea of a Galilean optical sight is basically think of a tubeless telescope. So you've actually got a lens on the front and a lens on the back, but nothing in between. Uh, and this was something that was adopted by the British kind of as a stopgap measure early in World War I. They didn't have a sniper program really, they didn't have sniper scopes, they didn't have anything really standardized, and a couple of companies offered we'll build you Galilean sights, and they'll just clip onto existing rifles, and there's basically no infrastructure to them. They're relatively cheap because they're pretty simple. You know, you're making a couple lenses that have, it's almost the equivalent of making a pair of eyeglasses where both sides are separate, and you clip one on the front and one on the back. Um, they do not offer much magnification, it's like two power at best, and they have a very small field of view. Uh, you know, these are, they're called Galilean because they were the the sort of teles version of a telescope before a proper telescope was invented. So um, I'd love to get a little more hands-on time with them, and I would love to be able to bring you guys one on video. The one time I was able to get a look at one, I didn't have a camera handy and wasn't able to do that. Um, and I think the reason that there are hardly any photos, they were probably, like, I don't think the British were really wanting to advertise their sniper stuff at that time. Very few survived the war because they got rid of them, I want to say by 1915, they basically scrapped that part of the program. Uh, and that's a thing that's very easily broken, very easily lost, and why would anyone keep them? You know, if you're in the trenches in 1915 and you have the chance to get rid of this Galilean thing and get a proper scope, are you going to carry around those Galilean sites for the rest of the war? No, you're going to keep them. Bracket says, do property of US government markings or other similar markings have any legal effect for resale? Do they increase or decrease the value of a firearm? Interesting question. Um, having a gun or magazine marked property of US government does not carry any automatic legal uh, status. So just because it says it doesn't mean anything necessarily. Now, if the gun is legally property of the US government and you're not allowed to have it, uh, if you're not authorized to have it, if someone stole it from the government, then you can get in trouble. But you're getting in trouble because the gun is actually owned by the government, not because of a marking on it. There are a number of, of examples of things out there that are marked property of US government that are perfectly legal to own, and usually that will increase their value. Um, the one that comes to mind most recently was the, uh, the Colt Air Crewman revolvers. They're marked property of US Air Force, uh, which is a really it's a cool feature on them and it really helps distinguish them from commercial, similar commercial guns. Uh, and it did actually scare people at the time. A few people, a few of the guns have actually had those markings ground off because people thought that they did have legally binding status. Um, you'll also find magazines that were manufactured during the assault weapons ban, like 94 to 2004, that are marked law enforcement or like military law enforcement use only, restricted, some, you know, words to those effect. Those again have no legally binding status, and to some people they're going to be a cool memento of that law that is no longer in effect. So I'd say in general those markings, as long as they're legitimate, will increase the value. Um, I don't know of really any situation where they would decrease the value. Adam says, before the NFA was passed in 1934 and suppressors started to be regulated, how common was their ownership? Why don't I ever see vintage suppressors for sale like I do old NFA guns? So two part question here. I don't really have a good answer to the first half. How common were suppressors? How popular were they? I don't really know. Um, you really only had one company selling them, and that was Maxim, um, run by Hiram Maxim's son. And they were quite cheap but I don't know how many people actually use them. Now the second part of the question I have a better answer for, and that's why don't you see these things anymore? The answer is because they were so cheap. You're talking less than $10 for a suppressor, and when the NFA came into effect, it put a $200 tax on them. And basically, virtually nobody was willing to pay $200 in 1934 to keep their suppressor. Um, they just 
a lot of people didn't know that they became, you know, had to be registered. The people who did know either threw them away or just put them in the back of the safe and didn't talk about it. For a long time, the NFA was not uh, enforced the way it is today. Um, I know people who are mm, pretty old, uh, but who remember the days when, you know, if you were out there shooting an unregistered machine gun and some cop caught you, the punishment was like, they send the gun to ATF and you have to pay the tax and they register it and then give it back to you. Like that's the punishment. Today, people quake in fear at the idea of violating the NFA with an illegal machine gun and being subject to years in prison and hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines and never being able to legally own a firearm again for the rest of their lives. That's a more recent phenomenon. It used to be basically a slap on the wrist. Like if you get caught with it unregistered, they're going to make you register it. So. Um, however, legally, technically speaking, you cannot legally register an existing unregistered suppressor. You can make a new one, but you can't take an existing one and file paperwork to register it, which is really unfortunate. And that's probably the biggest reason why you don't see original vintage Maxim suppressors for sale. Uh, most of them weren't registered in the 30s. Most of them weren't registered. You know, the few that are around were probably registered in the Amnesty in 1968 when that um, well, when, when monetary values had shifted a bit, but today they're pretty much just underground things because they can't be legally registered. Legally they just have to be destroyed. Kyle says, hello Ian, I was curious in your travels visiting uh, different weapons collections and museums if you have come across night sites for World War I rifles. <clears throat> yes, yes I have. Actually I have a set on a French Bertier, which should probably surprise nobody. Uh, both the French and the Germans made fairly reasonable use of luminous night sights. Uh, I don't know the exact formulation. It was basically a luminous uh, paint that was applied onto um, you know, X, basically slightly oversized dots. Two dots in the rear, one dot on the front sight to give you glow-in-the-dark night sights. Um, the French did this as a permanent feature on the Berthier for a little while, around 1917. Uh, both the French and the Germans also had clip-on night sights. Uh, I don't think the Germans ever did a permanent night sight. I think theirs were all clip-on variety. Um, the French also put this sort of night sights on their machine guns. So the Hotchkiss 1914 guns in World War I uh, had night sights. In fact, they had them, um, many more of the machine guns had them uh, than rifles. Having the machine guns aimable and usable at night is more important than having individual rifles usable that way. So yeah, they were out there and they were not particularly rare. Um, they're not super common, they're not everywhere, uh, but they're far from the scarcest sort of accessory or modification to a World War I rifle. Uh, John says, with the drying up of parts kits from the so former Soviet bloc countries, we've seen a lot of US manufacturers ramp up production in-house with 100% American-made AK pattern rifles. However, they are universally seen as inferior and garbage when compared to their parts kit or factory-made counterparts for a variety of reasons. Why is that? Is there a historical anecdote, like growing pains the Soviet faced with developing stamped receivers? that's applicable. I have trouble understanding why a country with significant manufacturing infrastructure and technique cannot produce a rifle of similar, if not better quality than the AKs produced in countries with much more significant economic hardship. So there are, I think first we have a bit of a misconception here. Um, you're, you're referring to countries that originally made AKs as having economic hardship. That may have been the case if you were an individual citizen trying to buy some various consumer good. However, almost those governments pretty much across the board put a high emphasis on having good weapons. And these guns weren't built on a budget. Uh, and the problem, the fundamental problem with American made AKs is that they are built on a budget. So the problem is the Soviet bloc, everyone who's building AKs, and in fact it literally was everyone, like short of maybe Albania or North Korea, there were no like cheap, not so great AKs out there. Um, the Bulgarian AKs, the Polish AKs, the Hungarian AKs, the Romanian AKs, the Russian AKs, the Chinese AKs, these are all excellent guns. They're extremely well made. And then they come into the US, half the, that manufacturing cost all gets paid by the government when they're being manufactured. And then the wall falls, Soviet bloc disintegrates, 
And those guns are now being sold off by people who have zero money invested in them, and there's lots of them, and so they sell them cheap. And they come into the United States at, re at, at prices that are ludicrously low compared to the amount of effort and expense that went into making them. And that's, that's where we get this idea that AKs are cheap rifles to make. They're not cheap rifles to make. Uh, they just happen to be cheap rifles for us to buy secondhand because so many of them were made to very high standards many, many years ago. So the problem with American-made ones is that they're trying to compete with, say, a parts kit made in Poland in the 60s that would have cost thousands of dollars for that rifle to be made here today. But if I can go buy a Polish parts kit built gun for 600 bucks, why would I spend any more than that on an American-made gun? Like The American-made gun's got to be as good, and for the American-made gun to be made as well, its price is going to be huge, comparatively speaking. So all of the American manufacturers feel they have, well, have to compete price-wise with guns whose manufacturing cost has already been paid by someone else, uh, and so they have to do it on a budget. It's not that we can't make a good AK in the United States. You absolutely could. It, just would require spending the same amount of, of money, you know, having the same quality and the same attention to detail, which turns into the same amount of money, as the Soviet bloc countries did when they originally built those guns. Uh, Zachary says, what loadout or theme would you like to run Desert Brutality 2020 with? That is an interesting question that I have thought about a little bit. Um, so in general, at regular two-gun matches, I enjoy running weird, obscure guns. Kind of fun. And it doesn't really matter so much if they're really craptacular guns. If they are, if I kind of know going in that they're going to be difficult and not go well and my scores are going to be bad, that's not a big deal on a regular monthly two-gun match. Um, and it's interesting to get the experience. When it comes to Desert Brutality, this is a match that I know going in is going to be physically challenging and exhausting. Um, the last couple of years, well, this past year, it was up in St. George, Utah, so I was going to drive eight hours to get there, and then eight hours again after the match, and it was, you know, it's going to be like five days spent doing this match, including all the travel. I don't want to have a gun that actively is going to work against me. I want to be able to enjoy the match. Now that doesn't mean it has to be, you know, a completely modern gun. I shot the first Desert Brutality with a semi-auto FAMAS, that was a tremendous amount of fun, a very cool experience. I shot this year's Desert Brutality with a Brownells Retro 605, which again, great gun, ran perfectly. It's, it's an early AR-15. The ergonomics are good, the cartridge is good, the sights are good, the trigger was good. It was a gun that it wasn't 100% modern, didn't have optics, that sort of thing, but it didn't hold me back. And so that's kind of what I want to do for any future Desert Brutality. I want to find a gun that is both interesting, but also fundamentally a good gun that I can run the match well with. And so the three that I'm that, that have come to mind, and I'm far from having made any decision, I obviously need to talk to Carl about it, because often we try and uh, you know, mesh what we're doing so that you know, my guns and his complement each other in some way. But the three that occur to me, um, an M1 Garand, I think that that would be like hard mode, but an M1 has great trigger, great sights, the end block clips are pretty quick and easy to reload, I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, I would love to do one with a Sturmgewehr. Uh, I think that would be a really interesting and fun experience. And I think, again, in that case, you're looking at a self-loading, uh, high-capacity magazine, decent sights, decent trigger. You know, there's nothing fundamentally bad about that gun. What would be really cool is to run it with a legit NFA Select Fire Sturmgewehr. That would be awesome. Um, if HMG ever has their guns out on the market, that would be... 80% is cool, um, and that would be a fun one to do. Like, I'd be excited about doing that with a semi-auto reproduction Sturmgewehr, or a what would Stoner do carbine. And that, in some ways, that would be, that's, that's easy mode. Like, that would allow me to really see how well I can do in competition with the best rifle that I can come up with to take. So I kind of feel that's sort of, like, that cheating. Not cheating, but, like, taking the easy route by taking a what would stoner do carbine, but that would be fun. So that's what I'm thinking of. Who knows? I've got a while to figure that one out. All right, and our very last question is Dr. Jomama Chubby 
says, what gun are you guns are you currently chasing to get your hands on to review or to own? Um, there's always something that I've got the hots to own. Uh, however, there is a gun that I've been looking for for quite some time now to do a video on, because I've actually already done the first half of the video, and it's been sitting there waiting for over a year now. I'm just waiting for access to the gun, and the gun is a Keltoff repeater, which is basically the very first repeating military firearm. And the second half of the video that I've already done was done at the location where the Keltoff repeater was first used in actual military combat. And so when I had the opportunity to be there, um, I realized, you know, this would be super cool. I can do, here's, here's the first repeating gun, and here is physically where it was first used. So I have the geographical part, there aren't exactly a lot of Keltoff repeaters floating around, and I think like virtually all of them are in Europe. So sooner or later I will get my hands on one, and when I do, then I'll be able to finish off that video. So that's one that I'm always keeping my eye out for. And that is all of our questions for today. So uh, I haven't quite gone hoarse yet. A big thank you to all of my patrons uh, who submitted questions. You guys truly make Forgotten Weapons possible, and I deeply appreciate it. So. Uh, we'll be back again next month with another Q&A. Thanks for watching.